So, um, so this week we're um, in the the book club. We're working through chapter twelve of um, Outstanding News and Interfaces with Shiny. Um, we're probably only going to do the first half of this chapter because it's quite a long chapter, and um, in in this we'll be learning how to develop new input uh, elements for a shiny app so um so that you can define custom ways of entering data into into your app um it, it, being able to do that requires knowledge of uh javascript and r and how to send messages from one to the other and and, and back then and how to handle the data on both sides um and this week uh jack pensner uh, sorry Penzler is going to be uh, taking us through the, the content. Okay, so I'll leave it over to Jack if that's okay. Great. Cool, thanks Russ. I'm just gonna share my screen. And I'm just gonna do the, the whole desktop because there are a couple of times I would like to dip back into code or have a look elsewhere. And um, oh, didn't want that. Um, but yeah, you guys are getting my screen, right? Or yeah, if you are. cool. Um, so yeah, like Russ said, this chapter is pretty long, and we're gonna we're gonna go for the first half, really, um, or slightly more than half in terms of actual like length, but just the first, the main sections, so the section twelve point, I think it's up to three or four. Um, but what we kind of want to do is we want to start to unravel a bit of the magic of how Shiny allows us to do stuff in R or do stuff on the GUI and then that do some stuff in R code and that also do some stuff in JavaScript so that we get this interactive experience. Um, and that entails us becoming familiar with input bindings. So to do that, we'll try to walk through most of the step-by-step -step example in the book. Um, and what I tried to do is I tried to pick different checkpoints because otherwise, We'd, we'd be here for a long time, I think, if we did every single step. Um, but we tried to look at what's changed from step one, say, to step four. Um, and then Russ will have the unenvious task of hiding it up next week and trying to make it maybe a bit maybe a bit more simple. Um, okay, so if we've built anything with Shiny before, um, we're probably aware that the role of an input is to allow the user to do something like input some commands, a string, some, do some clicks or whatever. And that input travels through magically and then stuff happens. Um, and these are like the main list from Shiny. And I guess like these ones we'll all know like the text input or the checkbox input. Um, you do get the others like the update, input switch is like when you don't know some things that are going to go in input you might want to use update but all we need all we really need to have in mind is that there are these input functions and that we've probably used most of them and um, but there can be a case where we know that we want a specific input or we want to do something or allow the user to do something in shiny and we can't find the right input so i think the first thing that anyone should kind of do before like diving in and trying to make one themselves is go have a look at the ecosystem uh like shiny widgets shiny dashboard like uh bs for dash and all these packages that have lots of nice widgets and input things already implemented um but if you can't find find one or find a nice package that's already done it well what happens when you can't find the right one the answer should be you spend months learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to make your own. And that's the whole, that's the reason we're here. So let's, what we're gonna do actually, we're gonna dip into R and into here. So we're gonna get this example, which is here. And we're just gonna see kind of what's going on. So this is our slider input up here. and looking at the app you'd expect that when you move this slider um some stuff's going to happen so we're i guess we're sampling or we're making a bunch of like random data from our norm and as we get more and more data like 
stuff happens and we approximate a normal distribution. Um, but all this is very well and good um, as it's happening. But for us, the people who want to develop some things, well, we have to kind of understand how this is all happening. And one way to kind of understand uh, it's all happening is to break it. And the book shows us that we can type uh, this. And now, because we've unbound everything in the document, and now at the moment, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but what that does mean is that when we move this input, um, the histogram doesn't change anymore. So some magic was set up by some wizard and we just broke the spell, but we can restore magic to the world by rebinding everything in our in the document, the in the DOM. Um, it's pretty neat. Like I think it tells us kind of that these these bindings they're they're really important. So let me grab the slides back. Um, so yeah, I did put this little thing in that does feel like magic. That every sufficiently advanced technology is or should be indistinguishable from magic. Um, but we were able to get rid of the magic. Um, but more well, more specifically, um, oh, my link isn't really well form formatted. Um, but anyway, yeah, we were able to put the magic back in by rebinding everything. And this tells us that there's some kind of like binding process, which we're able to stop by editing stuff in the developer console. Um, and we're able to get it back by unediting stuff. And um, so, yeah, what is like an input binding more formally? And um, well, the book gives this example that in HTML, um, an input looks just like this. So you've got your standard HTML tag, um, like these bits, and you're saying that it's an input. And you have your ID, which we'll all kind of be familiar with um, by now, just from the book or just from using Shiny. Um, but that's our unique identifier and tells us the type and should have been a, another bullet. Um, but we can we can set a class as well. And when when we're using things like jQuery um, to identify different elements or whole classes of elements, well, it's often better to be able to search by a class um, or type than it is by ID. And yeah, like it says, because we're going to often be applying CSS styles as well. Well you definitely don't want to be doing them to individual IDs most of the time. And you do want to be doing them to things like classes. And the value is, yeah, the input value. So what the, what the thing does or what its role is or what like task it's, it's able to perform. And um, so we've got this, this uh, it's kind of, I guess when you're input, when you're implementing your own binding, let me just check I didn't skip anything down the bottom. Yeah. So when you're implementing your own binding, there's this kind of like skeleton. And right now it's it's a lot of JavaScript. Um, and as you can see here, like tells you, okay, well, you're gonna want to do like implement a find method, but the method's not actually implemented. And you're gonna want to do a bunch of other methods and for most of them, they're actually just like not implemented. Um, but the the comments are, I think they're pretty helpful, especially with hindsight of having come back to the chapter after reading it. But when I was reading this for the first time, I just did not have a clue really <laughs> for what was going on. Um, but yeah, if we can, as we go, if we can start to understand, well, what stuff should actually go in here? Um, and in here, and why is this a Boolean, and what, what would it mean? And then we might be able to build some form of mental model um, for creating creating our own input bindings. Um, so yeah, let's, let's 
crack on a little bit. Um, the book's example, the, the main example in the book is about creating a custom text input. And this, so this stuff should all look kind of familiar, I think. Um, it's how when you're in R or when you're in Shiny, we're used to having these arguments and what they do. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to see how does this thing, this implementation, which has some R code and some HTML and whatnot, how does that become its own input binding? Um, there was, so these are the R functions that are used inside the binding that we're going to look at step by step. Um, I think beyond just going through, there's not too much else to say. Might be a good point to stop really quickly. Just for any questions or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I think it's um, in in the input binding the the JavaScript code you showed earlier on. It's quite important to see that like that the the thing that's in these parentheses at the bottom of the function and then all the con the methods in there in um the, the the input binding seems to like it's 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 written for to 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 be applicable for every um element of that type in the um in in the app so for example the find method is able to find every element within a particular subset of the app i guess that um is is of a particular type so you could find every slider element within some mm -hmm. sub module of it whereas there are other methods in there that function on a specific instance of that um element so things like um initialize and um get state and things where there's an l el argument they're additionally that they're, they're they're written to work for a specific instance of the, the thing um it it, mm -hmm. it was a bit of a it, it came as a bit of a surprise when i first like read this in javascript for r but um yeah so it's anyway so. yeah well alu with amy's got his hand up so we'll let him jump uh, in thank you my own question is uh, directed to the shiny combine on that you run in the when you open the development tools on shiny so i would like to ask what about if i have like because the example you did was relating to the slider inputs. What about in case I have any other inputs with the with the shiny or bind or will I be able to also find it using any other will input you... apart from the slider inputs? Yeah. Um so that I think the the individual slider input is like one binding. And when you um when you do that thing that I did. Um, that the book shows you how to do, you unbind everything. So you stop any type of input binding that you have and you stop it working. Because we can, what might be nice to do actually, having thought about it, is this maybe when, uh, is in stuff I didn't think to keep in. But when you get into sources, you can see, uh, wait, where's the input binding? Is it gone? Ah, no, so, yeah, sorry, I'm on the wrong example. There are, there are different examples where it's much easier, and I don't know where it is in here, um, to see the full input bindings script that Shiny goes where it goes in here. Um, no, I'm thinking of the more general one. Maybe it's in, uh, I think I'm not gonna be able to find it, but I can open up a different um, a different example from, from R where you kind of see maybe what happens. So you got, uh, it's gonna be in history, isn't it? Maybe it's better if I get the book. Uh, bear with me a second, let's get 
these examples. Uh, we're gonna want this as well. So if we go to like one in here, so you've got like this update text and stuff. Um, if you go to the inspect in here and you go to the sources, you've got the bindings for this one. And I thought it was really easy to get the, all of the bindings as well. Ah, maybe it comes along later. Um, yeah, so sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. I, there is something in the, one of the chapters of the book where you get the bindings for everything and you get a better idea of what's being turned on and turned off when you execute uh, this shiny dot, unbind all stuff in the document. Um, ah, that's not even, hmm. Okay, yeah, I think, I don't, do you have anything, Russ, on that? Because my knowledge is a bit flimsy, clearly, on this stuff. Um, so the question is, um, the, the, sorry, the, um, sorry, it's the qu question, how does, how, how does the, the JavaScript object know how to unbind everything and bind everything? Oh, so I thought it was about, can you do this for other inputs other than sliders and all, all like what would happen to all the other inputs I have, but I may have misunderstood. Okay, right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, I mean, um, the, the text inputs and the slider inputs and things, they'll each have their own um, class that defines the methods that, that, that you're going to go through here um and similarly they'll have the, the 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 code for registering that input binding with shiny as well in in a in a separate javascript file um yeah uh i don't know so certainly if there's some custom input element that that you want to pr provide a binding for that that isn't already served by shiny or one of the ancillary packages um you you should be able to get pretty far by implementing code that looks similar to the code that's in this chapter in the, the first section of this chapter yeah i'm just looking for the he links to an app um and it's a much more complex app it's like it's not physics simulator or something oh yeah it's virtual yes yeah. so if we open up this um you get this entry level one. This is what I was thinking, I think, that has those input bindings for all the different types of input. Um, just have to remember how to actually get there again. So is it, yeah, so you got these, right? Um, and you've got, they'll all have their different methods um, implemented in different ways. And I mean, I've, straight up just say it's way beyond my like someone who's just being introduced to javascript to, to get there and tell the difference between them um but on a more complex app you've got like input bindings kind of more generally and this is kind of what we saw before right like i think it's verbatim maybe still the same but then you've got well okay this is the action button input binding and um Later on in the chapter, we do get a little look at like editing pre-existing input bindings. Um, and I think definitely it requires quite a bit of knowledge to actually do that. But yeah, you do get, we do get a look at it. Um, but I mean, if, if we get to the end and we haven't, like it's actually been the case that it took a long time to prepare, but we raced through, well, maybe we could come back to something like this and compare some of them. Um, but I'll get the book back up just in case, just in case I need it. Um, and we'll get the slides back up. So I do later on, we do get a little bit more of a look at these and like see them in practice. And I have tried my best to offer comments for each one as it changes, which are my very novice understanding of what's actually happened. And um, so let's, Let's take a little look at how we how we did this. So we've got these R functions that are going to allow us um, when we're in Shiny 
if you like, uh, use our inputs that we're making um, to make them interact, like Russ was kind of hinting at earlier, to make them interact with Shiny, um, like in JS, interact together, stuff has to happen. And that stuff is all implemented in the methods inside the bindings. Um, and we start with the step one. So this was the, this is like the step-by-step -step example. And I actually think the it's pretty valuable the bit of the book um, that does this because if we see in R when I try to call try to call this number one, well number two and then number three, etc. They all have uh, different input bindings. So let's actually just let's take a look at that. And um, in here, provided I can actually get there again. Why can I never? Bindings. Uh, so you have to put breakpoints and stuff in. So <laughs> scratch that. I'm not going to try to do that on the fly because I simply would fall flat on my face, I fear. Um, but let's have a look at like this code. So you see some code like this. And if you don't know JavaScript very well, like me, then even this, which is very simple, looks quite intimidating. Now you, you recognize a comment and you, you've seen in the previous chapters like up here um, some JavaScript stuff. So you're kind of aware what's happening. You've seen a bit of jQuery, but specifically this dollar sign here signals that this function um, is a jQuery function. Should have a T. Um, but then we're like instantiating some new type of thing and this thing is called custom text binding and it's a version of like an input binding and we saw the input binding um back up here just gonna drop to that so it's one of these so it has this stuff available to it and some more um but uh the extend is uh and you can see with the dollar sign that this is a jquery function um and what it allows us to do is to add new things to this so Right now, just up here, this is like nothing. But now we're going to implement um, the find method. And that the find method's job is to let, I don't even know who to call it, like let JavaScript or let Shiny identify the like bits in the document model that the the binding you're made, you've made is going to apply to. And in this case, we can see it's like input text. So this would be like the, the class or whatnot. And um, there's a console log, and this is because uh, this is step one, and the guy is taking us through it step by step, and this just helps you debug. And um, one thing that was in all of the all of the book is like you need to remember to return stuff when uh, writing in JavaScript. I think a lot of us who coded in R at least early on, we kind of didn't we knew or not we knew we saw functions that were implemented and they didn't explicitly return stuff like this be a very loose like basic function and then it, it would call the last thing that it wants to return and but in, in javascript it's a bit more strict and you can't do that um and yeah this is like the end step so once everything else is done well we register it um under text so like there it's quite a small function but it felt like to me like there's it's if you because well it's quite involved or there's a lot of stuff that at least if i were left to my own devices i wouldn't know where to start and um, so i think it, it even blossoms quite quickly though so we skip a few steps and um, and now our our input binding looks like this and what I've tried to do is I've tried to just compare the bits that are new. Um, so we had nearly everything that was around before, but we did lose like this console log from the find method. We remember before there was console log, but we've got some we've got some new methods. Um, and the first new method is get value. So we with find, we kind of hold JavaScript or whoever 
the, the magical elves of JavaScript, like where to go to find our binding. Um, and now with get value, we have a method that we can ident we can find that part of the document model. So we can find our binding in there and we can check the value that that input is currently like stored with or like the current state of the input. So when the, when the user does something, we'll wanna like have some kind of callback or some kind of event which gets the value so that it can later be passed on. Um, but then next we have set value. So in here we have set value. And this is just a very simple method that says like, and if someone types something in or whatnot, like well, once they're stop, once they stop typing, um, take that thing they just typed in there and just set that as the new value. So now you can like the values can change as the user interacts. Um, we have receive message. Um, now this one, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and it's basically the way of like, this is my lack of understanding, probably gonna not be the clearest uh, explanation, but it tells, um, it's like the object itself. So the input, it kind of allows it to do stuff. Um, and to do that, it has like this little bit of error checking. So we just check that there is a value. And I think this is to do with nulls, nulls in JavaScript. Like if there's no value here, or if it's a null or something, you don't want to break stuff by trying to set nulls everywhere. So we check that there is a value. Um, and then we can set the new value if we need to. So we call this method. Um, and there was a note about this. I didn't leave it in, but it's like, this is just the actual thing itself. It's like self in Python or our object oriented programming. Um, and then set the value and then like make this event happen, this trigger that tells other stuff that stuff has changed. And um, it, it, like, it does make sense that you, you need to tell um, something that's it's changed but for us before I think it's just implicit in everything we do is like stuff changing by magic um, but this is like you know we're we're unraveling the magic um, and then yeah subscribe um, waits for as it stands right now subscribe has like an event listener on um, key up so when key goes back up or the person stops typing or the input is clicked or whatnot um, and yeah we can we can log the event but right now we're starting to implement it so like if it were a text input person can type and then the callback happens and the callback is just get value or set value I forget one of the two um, but there's kind of a problem and I guess my not really a question, but like what's missing at the moment from this implementation that you've you've maybe seen in um, Shiny before or used to stop it happening? Um, and why would it be potentially annoying if if this implementation was the end? Um, and those are kind of open questions if anyone has any ideas. Okay. Um yeah, so is it um is it is it is it clear from this code what actually happens when like you uh attempt to update the value associated with an element from the shiny server code? What happens um, when data is sent from the server to the front end? Is it clear? Well, so like I think it it's it's somewhat clear. It's, it is a bit murky for me, but it's like um, this is like an event listener or something. And so it's looking mm. out for the person to stop typing or the input yeah. to be like affected. Um, it's gonna like log that there was an event, so like that's gonna be kept track of. And then there's this callback. Um, and I did put a note in one of the things about callback. And I think callback is just calling 
get value or set value but it's still right now we don't know yeah where anything goes right like um there's 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 definitely still stuff to come but what i was thinking here and it does get answered the next one is like if you've ever implemented like i can't remember if it's selectize or there's there's various text inputs where like you if you're not a quick typer then you type a couple of letters and then it starts refreshing your whole app and that's really annoying because that doesn't happen when you're using like apps that are professionally web developed so in the next step we're going to see how you stop stuff like that happening by adding to the logic um but we will also see there are a couple more methods um that get implemented and i suppose we'll see if it completes the circle like you get the whole thing of like users doing something to an input and then stuff happens and then the server's changing and then it's changing for the user um so that was it was maybe a difficult question um but in step six we've got like the full implementation um and that looks like this um what it does or what it adds and i'm not going to try to do this without looking but like you can see there's an extra one of these um so there's an extra event listener there is a get rate policy um and that has debounce and a delay so then there's finally there's like when you want this input to stop working like when you want it to stop taking inputs and i wasn't sure exactly why you would want to I, I did a little Google and it, I think it was, it's to do like, if you're in different parts of the app, it's like switch this thing off because it doesn't need to run anymore. Like maybe if you're in a different tab or if you're on a different page. Um, but looking at what's like, what's fully changed is, yeah, we've got this, we've got this additional event listener, um, which is, which is this one. Um, and that's linked to this. So, when this receive message thing fires, um, it sets off a trigger that there's been a change. And this thing, subscribe, listens for that change, for that trigger. And when that trigger happens, will it, its callback is like activated. Um, so you can see like either the user stops typing or the I should have looked exactly what this is. I figured it was when the input was like clicked or something. I don't know if you press enter, but I'm not 100% sure. So I can't say. But then this one is just, yeah, whenever this happens, now do my callback. Um, and then we have below below this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is callback still being used to get value? And is that general behavior? So that was something. I didn't think was I'm not actually I'm not going to say it wasn't explained well I'm going to say I didn't understand fully or I missed the part where it fully tells you what callback does um but yeah I had this as a question um in in my mind and in in my notes um but below that we've got the get rate policy so this thing is like I can't remember what package it comes from in shiny but you can you can add debounce to inputs and the delay, I think it's in MS and this says like 250 MS. So the user's typing, um, like they say you, you allow them to input a hex code or something like uh, the benefit of anyone who's like looking hex, I'd always be like this for hex code. I'm like, oh Christ, what is it like? I don't know, I can't remember now, like any hex codes, but it mean something like that. And you get to there and it starts like giving you an error because that isn't valid or something or like, I don't know. So then you're like, oh, it's that. And then it's not that. And you're going back and it, your app is just like shaking at you and kind of screaming. Well, if you have this thing, if you have debounce instead, every time you stop typing, you've got another 250 MS to start typing again before it yeah. will um, refresh the whole app. Um, yeah so i guess finally um there is this was 
I did notice that this is now, this one is input dot text, um, text input binding instead of custom text binding. So I wonder if that was an error or if I just don't understand why it would be like that. Um, but finally you've got unsubscribe and the idea is, yeah, um, switch off this button. So I, I, I would suppose sometimes you wanna switch off a button, like there are things you wanna only let the user do once. Um, and perhaps if you use unsubscribe after they do it once and you give them a reset button where well, you can make sure that they, they're not changing stuff later in the app, but you don't want them to. Um, but yeah, I wasn't sure what happens um, if you don't do this. Like, I guess it's just bad stuff. Um, and does anyone have any ideas what happens if, if we don't do this? I'm 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 not sure to be honest. I'm yeah, it, it, trying to. I I don't entirely know where in the um in the startup or the teardown of a shiny app that each of these methods would be called by the shiny object. I suspect that might be. I, I suspect it might be explained in chapter 13, but it might not. Be. Um, yeah. 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 I'll have another look, maybe have another look for that. Um, it's that it, it might be that the guy explains it in a sentence. And I it was, I read it the first time a few days ago and then come back to yeah. it, but maybe didn't flag it up. Um, what I did have a question as I was going through is, there's as far as i could see there's no initialize here um and right. in the this thing you okay yeah this is so like it's not because it's not an exact copy of this right but these are these are the shiny ones i think um yeah, yeah. but there isn't so I didn't personally know exactly what initialize would do. And I was thinking it would be more like in a class in Python or like yeah, yeah. that you yeah, do it every time. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so I couldn't see why yeah. there wasn't. Um, but in the, the, the one that's been implemented, you are effectively inheriting from shiny dot input binding which will uh, have yeah. an initialized method defined for it yeah that's right so you're just extending here like yeah yeah you're like essentially appending stuff um and everything else that you don't change you just want it to behave as it would mm -hmm. up in here yeah that's yeah that makes a lot of sense nice um yeah. so Let's see, these, these ones, they definitely won't take us long. We, what we might be able to do <laughs> is these are, is to go back and do this stuff and change this from one, two, three, and have a little look. But let's, let's see where we do get from. So I think these, we actually saw this earlier, didn't we? Um, did speak about very briefly, and this, these were like footnotes almost, um, the guy was saying, uh, what was it, get ID, and where's the other one? Um, oh, there was, oh, get type. Yeah, so like you just never really <laughs> need to do these and rely on the defaults. But that was, I think this added to my confusion perhaps about initialize, because so he doesn't mention other ones that we don't edit, but I guess when you're a bit more familiar with how this all works, you can kind of figure out that yeah. you're just, yeah, you don't need to set them because you're only appending. Um, there is a a naming convention, and like he says, so to avoid <laughs> avoid your conflicts, um, you should make a package when um, when you create a custom input. Um, and I don't know practically if that makes that much 
not um, it definitely makes sense but i don't know how hard that makes it um i imagine it's it's not that difficult just to make a package um but he gives this example is like uh there are formally you see well you see them as this but formally they're this um, and that mm. follows this naming convention and there is just um a way like a lookup table to go from this to this and um, i thought i'd flag it because it's the kind of thing that i think when you come to do it as long as we're aware of it like some yeah. bell distant bell in your head will go off and you'll be like oh there is something i should yeah. do here um, and so that, and that that's the thing that goes into um what is it the the register binding code isn't it uh hold on where is it now um uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. where is it now there's yeah shiny dot input bindings dot register that's where ah, you yeah. that's so that um the shiny object has a, a a single name that describes all elements of a, a particular type so your shiny dot action button input is referring to the the type of action button that's defined in the shiny package whereas uh, sorry no it was a text input that we were defining here so the custom text input that we've defined here mm -hmm. should have a, a name that can that that can be distinguished from the shiny dot text input um yeah, well, I think it, it would be okay. just by by not being text in because it'd be custom. But say if mm. you were like, if someone if you're using someone else's package, and they'd yeah. also made a custom text input, and you'd have this like namespace thing, you've stored it in a package. Yeah. And you could never really have that conflict. Um, but and so that's in shiny dot input bindings dot register. I do remember reading about that. Um, probably should have put that in here. <laughs> um, yeah, good. I think good call out as well because it'd be quite easy to not understand or not for me to think. Well, why do I need to go all the effort to make a package for any of my inputs? Um, but I guess if you want them to be reproducible and if you want them yeah. to use them, you kind of would anyway. But it plays this dual purpose of preventing conflicts you, I, you could definitely imagine like custom radio button being the exact name multiple people use um, yeah 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 so i <laughs> i was just sort of joking here we're gonna re-implement from scratch um we're not um but what i thought we could maybe do is a recap and we don't necessarily need to might be more interesting to actually start going through those examples of like the binding one binding two binding three but just commenting almost or like talking about this bit step by step together about what's happening and how we would comment this um but it might that might be might be a bit bogus okay right let's um let's do that then um are we gonna take the methods in turn or um are we yeah let, let's take them in turn i'm going to open up um my r when i've got this and what is this this is another one this is the one so we could i guess this would be like a general description we could leave that to the end um so what are we doing at each stage um and if you dictate or if we discuss I'll, I'll just type it in and save it ahead of the, okay. the pull the pr okay so um well this is just uh, it's it's defining the, the the javascript object that you're extending from here this defines an input binding object and the input binding object is a a thing that shiny uses so that it can access and manipulate particular inputs um, 
Yeah, and then so what? This is where the inheritance happens, right? Like implicitly yeah, yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. 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 Inheritance is a bit weird in JavaScript, though, isn't it? It's like you're. It's like you. The inheritance is like um, I want to make an object that looks like that object, rather than I want to make an object that's described by this blueprint. Um, okay. So you're um, you're creating an object shiny dot input binding and then extending that object. Um, so that's more a side note on the language. Yeah, okay. create the object and then edit or, yeah. I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try to be, sometimes it pays to be vague when, when particularly for me when I'm new to JavaScript. <laughs> so I'll yeah. try to be a bit vague here. Um, Okay, so I think I guess Oluwafemi or Trevin, if and if you guys like are still in here and stuff, and you're listening, and you want to take a crack at any part, um, just yeah, jump in. So I'll give you a few seconds to see if you want to. Okay, so I'll I'll take um I'll take a go a stab here like we are like implementing the jQuery method find to allow um shiny to access our element in the DOM by the DOM input X, which I think is class right rather than type um in CSS. Yeah. I think that method belongs a, a line below where it is. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I agree though. Yeah, um, no, sure. I, I'm, I'm happy I, for... I, what, what, it's, what that find method's actually doing is finding all elements of class input text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So it, it's a way, because obviously, like, the JavaScript code doesn't know which identifiers your um, R-based UI and server code are going to define during the lifetime of a Shiny app. So you have to write the JavaScript code such that it can work without the knowledge of those identifiers. And what this find method does, it, it's a way of saying given the 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 dom as it currently exists find me all elements within it that are of this particular class or that have this particular um um type or, or something like that mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i've what i've tried to do is to edit it then it's like when we look for this make my element appear or like be accessible rather than just find my element by looking for this it would like does that clarify no the, the, it the, no, the, 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 the issue i was trying to get across was that this is going to find multiple elements if multiple elements exist it's not going to find a specific element and those that collection of elements will be filtered you know if you want to update the value on a specific element mm -hmm. the collection of elements will be um, filtered to find the right one but so this is like it's it, it it's finding all elements that are um that are defined by this input binding. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, okay. So it's more yeah, more general. Um to accept to find it's fine to allow shiny to or mm, oh, yeah, no, that's fine. Sorry, I just had to respond to something. Um yeah. so whenever we look for stuff um 
in the DOM, let's use this method to find everything that is this. Um, yeah, yeah. To find, find all of this thing in the DOM. So perhaps I can escape again through being vague. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so how do we feel about the, oh i will actually add i'm going to add one for what the dollar dot extend is um but this is for the find so do you want to tell us what this is kind of russ like this thing yeah well um the the custom text binding because it's uh, uh, at the point where it's defined on line 375, it has all attributes and methods defined for shiny dot input binding. So there already will be a find method defined. There may mm -hmm. well be a, a get value and a set value and things defined on that object. So what we're doing here on 378 onwards is either updating or defining um, the methods that for that custom text binding such that they're specific to that um to, to that particular input binding okay yeah so we update or define i think i've gone for um because like you said yeah some of they yeah. it would already have one but we're, we're maybe changing it um <laughs> and here we'd like allow shiny to access the value associated with the input thing associated is quite a an esoteric term i guess but maybe again vague enough that it just about passes um, and then for set that oh we've got quite a few so for set value um what does it want to do here Well, this, this is a way for JavaScript to update the value on a specific element. Yes, yeah, so allow JavaScript to update the value of the slash and a element. Um, yeah, well, the okay, problem, nice. The so problem with that is it doesn't necessarily update the value that shiny's server can view of uh, uh, you know so it it updates the, uh, the the elements value in the dom but not necessarily it, it has no consequences for the 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 value that java uh, that ours server can see when when an app is running mm. so do you have to send that separately like as a yeah 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 Okay, yeah, well, but, but, um, uh, so, uh, I'm going to stop writing, please. Okay, so receive message. So this was like the thing, It this is what, uh, so uh, check there is a value, because we don't want to send null, or we don't want to send null stuff on. So that's like the first thing you're there, keep doing this. Um, then you want to like uh, pull the set value method. So do the stuff set value does, and then trigger change event. Um, um, yeah. the, the thing about the, the receive message thing is that's basically how values that are sent from the shiny server to the front end are um, um you, you know that that that's how you that's how you communicate from the server to the front end basically in a, a shiny app um so 
Shiny will send, what is it? A custom message or or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the 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 the, the terminology is. Um, and um, for us here, what happens is when um, when JavaScript receives a message on an input binding, it will then search for the element that it um, is that corresponds to that message. And mm -hmm. update the value on that on the UI front, and then this trigger of change will also. I think it kind of. I think that's the how you send the updated value back to the server side to update whatever's associated with you know input dollar my hex mm -hmm. button or whatever it is. Yeah, because I was wondering, which is that, is that not down either on this callback? Mm, yeah, callback, yeah, yeah. And then the, what this but, is is like it, it's a, it's like an alert, like a, a a light goes on and says something's changed. So now pay attention to it, and then do do something after you realize that something's changed. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the receive message method, there, your there's code there that triggers that change dot custom mm -hmm. text yeah, binding yeah. event. Yeah. So I'm not sure because I'm not subscribed. But yeah, it's I because I was thinking it's like there's there's two things. There's I know I need to do something, and that's like trigger it's like telling me or it's communicating with um server that like stuff's happened or a value's changed somewhere mm -hmm. and then there's the actual protocol of like going and doing it um and that's maybe this callback yeah yeah um but right we're at five i think what we could do is i will I'll leave these. I'm guessing some people are going to have to hop off. What I would say is I, so I did, there are little bits on, there's a step-by-step -step process. This is just from the book. Um, yeah. And this is also kind of like just from the book. Um, but I will, I'll send in a, a PR and I'll actually, I realized I hadn't even done this, uh, the last one I did. So I'll send those in. Um, but then I'm away on holiday next week, Russ. So I'll have to catch up on the video um, for the stuff that you take on. But I'll, I'll yeah, make yeah. sure this stuff's in here for you. Cool. Brilliant. Brilliant. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for <laughs> taking us through that. It, there, there was an awful lot. I mean, we only really covered the first main section of that chapter, but there's such a lot of content in that chapter that... Um, and and also I think understanding that first section is key to the, the rest of that chapter, really. Um yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Thanks a lot. Um so next week we're gonna do the second half of chapter 12. So more on input bindings and chapter 13, which is about the life cycle of a shiny app, which you know, you know, when the bindings are populated and when they're torn down and things like that um brilliant okay right uh thanks and by all means you know you can keep in touch on the the slack channel if there's if you're working through the examples in this chapter or anything like that and you get stuck or anything yeah. cool um, see you all next week Oops, nice sorry. one. Oh, just a remark i don't know if you've already done it russ but the the stop thing for, for john yes